All right, troops, strong and conditioned, live and direct from the Strong and Conditioned podcast. And I am happy to announce I have got one of my favourite all-time guests on the show tonight. I had to have this man back because he's been a big influence in my training and many others. It's the one and only Jared Miller. How are you tonight, Jared, my friend? I'm doing fantastic. Best I've been in years. I can see that, mate, because you're looking like a chiseled Greek god. I appreciate that. Yep, yep. It's uh, things are going about as good as they possibly can. I, I think I've really hit that extra gear and just riding it as hard as I can. That worries me a, a little bit, Jared, because <laughs> the, the the very fact that you've got an extra gear is quite scary. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it, you just got to keep digging. You'll you'll. It's it's really hard to find that uh, that final part. And uh, in the pursuit of it, we unlock quite a bit in ourselves. I find it's. I've always been so big on don't worry about overtraining. You know, if, if you somehow manage, congratulations, you achieve something great along the way. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, mate. Because let's be honest, the one thing that attracted myself to your training was that I had never seen anyone train with the intensity that you do. And I think that's your unique selling point in the fitness sphere. So, Jared, just for people who are listening to you for the first time, can you... Give us a little bit of background on yourself and how you've got to the point where you are currently at. Absolutely. So I always lead off by saying that I've been training for 23 years. I'm um, counting starting at 14 where I bought a play it against sports standard weight set with a bench and two dumbbells. And that was uh, the beginning of it. And uh, I've been going on through there. Uh, originally, it was uh, to get better at mixed martial arts, or at the time, really just martial arts. And then from there, it evolved into powerlifting, did three meets there. Then I got into strongman. I've done 13, 14 competitions there, started in 2013. And I'll still do a strongman competition here and there. I'm not going to say I'm retired, but, I'm, I, you know, unless it's fun, it doesn't really interest me. Now I'm just kind of carving my own path these past few years and just sort of finding my own challenges and competing against myself and seeing what's out there. Uh, I'm five foot nine. Uh, I'm about 181 pounds today. Uh, and uh, 181 is what I competed at as a uh, power lifter. As a strong man, I've been a lightweight. Um, you know, I've, I, I read a lot of iron history. I'm a big fan of that. I train in a home gym. I've never had a coach before. And I'm just big on discovery is really what it boils down to. This is just one big experiment. I'm just sort of seeing what I can do and what I can get away with and where the limits are. And so far, it's been hard to find them. Okay, Doc. So let's go back. Right, Let's just take it right back through the history of Jared Miller. And let's speak about your first forays into the world of training. How did you start off? What kind of programs were you doing? Was it conventional cookie cutter style programs? Was it just throwing stuff at the wall and see if it sticks or did you have a, a set plan in mind from the get-go oh my goodness no no set plan so you know it's funny my, my dad really was like one of my biggest fitness influences and it's not that he was in phenomenal shape necessarily although you know everyone's dad is their superman to them and so do my to me yeah my dad was the strongest man in the world and he was incredible but he had these stories that he would tell me and it's it's why i'm so not into science because I think we get a lot more from stories. I think we get a lot more from myths. I think we get a lot more from legends than we do from science. Science is so limiting, but stories, they don't have to have a, an end to them. And so my dad would tell me about when he was in the Air Force and he knew guys in basic training that were just ripped to the gills because they did 200 pushups a night before bed. So I'm like, oh, I guess that's the number 200. So I just got to get there. And so I was 14 years old and working my way up to 200 pushups a night because I'd get ripped to the gills if I did that. And then he would tell me about a guy who got a six pack in six weeks because he did 200 sit-ups a night. 200 seemed to be like the magic number. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I got to do 200 push-ups and 200 sit-ups a night. All right, cool. I'm going to do that. And then, of course, I got to lift weights because, you know, I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger and he was jacked and Hulk Hogan and he was jacked. And Hulk told me to say my prayers and eat my vitamins and live clean and lift weights. And Popeye told me to eat my spinach. So I was eating spinach. Yeah, I just I, – I, I there wasn't a, a single, like – book or author or article there was no science to it whatsoever it was pure just intensity throwing crap against the wall seeing what stuck i got that weight set from blade against sports it had a bench press it had a creature curl station it had leg curls and it had uh dumbbells so every day five days a week i would 
do flat bench until I got tired. And then I would do preacher curl until I got tired. And then I would curl the dumbbells until I got tired. And then I do the leg extension until I got tired. And then, you know, the weekend would roll around. And if I had time, I'd do it then. And if not, I'd just wait till Monday rolled around again. And eventually I got access to my high school weight room, which was modern because it had a lap pull down machine in it. And, <laughs> and so I got to, you know, use that and to do some chin ups and, yeah, I, I, geez, like the first time I read anything on training, I'd probably been lifting weights for about three years. And then finally, like I found a, a web forum. I went on, on game FAQs of all things for video games. And I actually went there because of martial arts. Uh, I was at a arcade and I saw Tekken 3 playing in the background. One of the characters was named Paul Rong and he was doing Taekwondo forms. I thought that was cool. So I went on game and I think he was to talk about that. And I'm like, oh, hey, look, a, a martial arts training forum. And there they were talking about lifting weights. And so I, I read about lifting weights for like the first time. And that was when I actually started, you know, quote unquote, learning uh, about how, how to lift. Do you remember the, the actual book that you first read or the first program? So the first book I ever like sat down and actually read about on training was Beyond Bodybuilding by Pavel Statsuline. Uh, by that point, though, I'd already been reading a lot of online articles because I was still a kid, right. so I wasn't going to buy anything. <laughs> so, yeah, but, yeah I, I read a lot of uh, West Side Barbell, um, uh, Joe DeFranco's West Side Barbell for Skinny Bastards, um, articles here and there. Um, I, I was a little bit aware of Teen Nation at that point, uh, around the time I was 17. I'd seen an article here and there. But yeah, the first time I ever sat down, like read an actual book cover to cover on training was Beyond Bodybuilding by Pavel Statsmine. See, that's quite an advanced entry into the book game. I mean, when I think of myself, it was like some daft book that I bought in a bodybuilding shop when I was 16. And it just consisted mostly of pictures and a very generic bro split routine. Mm. But it worked. It mm -hmm. beautifully. Oh, that's the thing, yeah. And so I will take that back. There was a book on physical training that I bought before that. Yeah. Yeah, and that was um, uh, Lauren P. Christopher, uh, who, power training? It was it was something about specifically for martial arts training, and that's why I, I pivoted from there. It was about developing explosive punches, explosive kicks. And so I did read that book first. I got to ask for it for a birthday present because I still wasn't going to spend money. Uh, but yeah, when I, an actual book dedicated specifically to lifting, that was uh, Pavel's. And yeah, I never, I never read the muscle mags because, so I went to an all boy Catholic high school and it was one of those, if they saw you reading one of those books, they'd, uh, they'd think things and say things. <laughs> I actually enjoyed the Beyond the Bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Something quite amusing about mm -hmm. Pavel's style of writing. It was, there, there was a machismo oozing from it, which I think was what, kept you reading the book it was it was more funny to me than like the information it was more the humor i extracted from the book mm -hmm. but ultimately the reason i ask is because i i was watching a video the other day and the guy who was uh, hosting the video a guy called faz lifts mm -hmm. he, made, he made a great point and it was talking about how nowadays we all consider like volume to be the, the, the driver of hypertrophy or intensity. But he was going back 20, 25 years ago and no one thought like that then. Mm -hmm. All we had was the cookie cutter program. Mm -hmm. But they worked beautifully at that oh. time. Oh, yeah. I no, mean, it's absolutely true. And, and, and you know, it, it's... It's a, it, it's this interesting thought people have that when new information comes out, it invalidates old information and that new success somehow invalidates old success. And it's like, no, it just it just compounds. There's now even more ways to succeed, which is, is testament to just how stupidly simple this is. And no one likes to hear that, because when you hear that success is simple, that means that failure is on you. That they'll, if the re, the way to succeed is simple and, and anyone can grasp it and you're not grasping it, then it's a you issue. But if it's complex and mysterious and shrouded in mystery, well, then, of course, there's no reasonable expectation for you to succeed. You don't have the tools to do so. But guys have been getting jacked for millennia. 
Like, you know, we, we didn't have, we, we had like etchings on stone tablets on how to get strong. And, and, you know, people were just eating animals and, and lifting the very same animals and getting jacked because it's so simple. You just, you lift heavy stuff and then you eat a lot of food and your body's like, Oh, I guess I better get big then. Um, Hey, before we go any further, can I swear on your podcast? Is that, is that of course, fun? of course. Right. I, I try to keep it family style, but a lot of times it just kind of comes out. So I just, but, but yeah, no, I mean, it's just, and so, yeah, I mean, like, you know, bro splits, everyone's like, oh, you can't do a bro split. It doesn't work. You got to, you got to train a muscle, you know, at least two, three times a week. I'm like, well, well, shit. So I tell everyone in the sixties that in the seventies and the eighties, like that's all we did was bro splits. You just, you, you, and that's because like you hammered your legs, you absolutely hammered your legs. And then you walked like a toy soldier for five days. And then finally, like the Monday would roll around and you could finally train them again. So you train them and then just start the whole process over again. And if someone said, Hey, you got to train your legs twice a week, you look at them like they're an idiot. It's like, what do you, I can't, bend my leg and you want me to train it like it no it's done man i did 40 sets of squats on monday my legs are trained they're good <laughs> so why do you like just just as a thought why do you think we've came to this point in fitness where everyone is trying to disprove each other well because there's money i mean that's that's the long and the short of it I, money got involved the the idea that there's a fitness industry is mind-blowing <laughs> and I realized here we are on a podcast and and I uh, I, I dutifully uh, have people that support uh, what I do. But, you know, everything I do is for free. And it's because of the fact that, like, the secrets aren't secrets. It's just hard work. And you can't sell that. You can't sell hard work. You can't sell eating right and training hard and waiting because patience is the secret. It just takes a while. It's just, it, and, and and any physical endeavor just takes a while. You can't learn how to play guitar in a day. You can't learn how to swim in a day. You can't learn how to speak a foreign language in a day, but everyone thinks you can get jacked in a day. And it's just so weird. And the thing is, if you want it bad enough, someone will sell it to you. Absolutely. And, and you will disbelieve reality so that you can believe this salesman so that you can throw your money at them and then buy false hope. And, and to the point that people really like, if they succeeded, they'd probably be crushed because now what are they going to do with all that money and time that they had invested? Like, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting situation, but if they can just keep chasing this dragon and, and feeding into the rabbit hole, uh, their, their paychecks, you know, how phenomenal, you know, there's a story about how Joe Weider and Bob Hoffman, uh, they sold barbells. And they went almost bankrupt because you buy a barbell and if it's a good quality barbell, you can pass that on to your grandkids. Yeah. You yeah. buy it one time. So they switch to supplements and you buy a supplement and you're out of that supplement by the end of the month. You got to buy the supplement again. And <laughs> suddenly Bob Hoffman and Joe Weider are millionaires. You know, it's it's just the reality of the situation. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be like a, a, a cyclical nature of information. Mm hmm. I cast my mind back to dinosaur training always stands out by Brooks Kubik. Mm -hmm. When dinosaur training came out, no one squatted. I remember a time when you went to the gym and the squat rack, if there was one, was always empty. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You always got your spot on the, the, the squat rack. And then the works of Brooks Kubik and Stuart McRoberts started to filter through and squats and deadlifts became the big thing. Joe DeFranco and co, like sort of bringing that message forward to the point where we've still got some residue of that level of thinking. Mm -hmm. And you cannot get a squat rack in the gym for love or money. They are no. all taken up. But at this point, we're starting to get pure hypertrophy, mechanical tension, resistance profiles, angles, and that movement towards the machines and cables is coming back again. So at some point, the squat racks are going to become empty because the words are starting to filter through that squats are not optimal for hypertrophy. And so I think that's, that's my issue with fitness in that context is that it just becomes like cyclical. The and, information comes and goes, but, but it's always the same information. Well, and the interesting observation, <clears throat> the information changes, but have the outcomes. No, like, no, no. no it, everyone still looks terrible in the gym. 
Everyone, <laughs> everyone still is not succeeding in the gym. It, it's not like suddenly Bruce Kubrick came down with stone tablets and suddenly the world was jacked. Like people who were doing the machine circuits suddenly just started squatting and were still doing terrible because they never keyed in on the effort being the driver there and the consistency. They just they they thought it was the method. And they, they just always want the method to be the answer. And the method's not the answer. The method is merely a delivery mechanism to the end result, to the outcome. Okay, so, so let's expand on that. What are the ingredients for success in a program, Jared? Well, so, you know, I always have my, my big three, and that's uh, effort, which uh, I like to call intensity. But you say intensity, and people think that means percentage of one rep maximum, and it gets stupid. So, so effort, uh, consistency, and time. And that's it. So you gotta you gotta work hard. You have to frequently work hard, and then you have to do it for a long time. And people like mix up what consistency and time means. But what will happen is like people have like one good workout, and then they'll either stop working out for weeks or months because spring break you know ended, and now they don't need to be in shape, or they're just phoning it in. And then you know maybe another good workout comes along. It's like no, like you gotta every single workout you got to put in as much as you can and then people get stupid about that and they'll be like oh i gotta take pre-workout i gotta psych myself up i gotta it's like no i i train at three or four in the morning often fasted no stimulants and usually it's the last thing i want to do i legit wake up and think to myself i do not want to do this and i go in and i just pour myself into it and sometimes i don't even come close to my best numbers but my effort is still right up there in the red line the whole time. And so maybe I could drop from having squatted one weight for 30 reps. And now I can only do it for 20 reps that day. But all that, at the end of that 20th rep, my eyeball is bursting out of the socket and I've blown out all my blood vessels. Congrats, Jared. You, you achieved your goal. You hit the max effort that you needed to succeed. Yeah. So in that respect, efforts only like relevant to the day where you perform the actual, actual session. As opposed to being some attribute that you can s scale accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It's it, it's all within context, and that's the thing people people don't like that. They want to they, people want to know what they're going to do before they get there, and that's so funny to me. I, you know, chaos is the plan. I've been saying it for quite a while now. Chaos is the plan because when you embrace that, you have control of the chaos. But if you go there and say, "Well, in order for me to succeed," I did four sets of three yesterday, so I have to do four sets of four. And then you don't do it, you're crushed. It's like, yeah, but think how much harder you worked today to not get that fourth set of four versus the last time you did it where it just came easily. Like, no, you're growing. You're putting your body in a state where it's learning, hey, there's this demand signal being placed upon me where I need to improve because if I don't, I will die. And that's, that's ultimately what it boils down to is we're just – telling the body you need to improve you need to improve you need to improve or there are consequences yeah and, and if it doesn't understand that it has no reason to improve so see in that respect like just as a thought here it's all about just steadily increasing that baseline as opposed Absolutely. to coming super fit it's like just let's keep taking that baseline mm -hmm. and keep just pushing it up a notch over time instead of like having these ball busting sessions that just get more intense intense as time comes on just having that 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 foundation which we can steadily improve yep yep and, and you know that's what's really kind of funny to me is uh i'll oftentimes uh, i'll post a video on youtube of me doing a kind of conditioning session and i'll title it like simple conditioning quick conditioning and <laughs> that one lights up like gangbusters and people are like oh this looks like such a ball buster i can't wait to do it and I'm like <laughs> Guys, that was like my weekend. Like, I got 20 minutes. I got to get something done today. Like, I feel stiff sort of work. This was <laughs> me. But when I post, like, I'll post me, like, giving my soul in a workout and just everything's out there. I'll get, like, three thumbs up and no comment. And I'll get, like, 56 <laughs> views. Because, because people won't appreciate those workouts that you're talking about where it's like, hey, guess what? Today, I pushed myself just a little bit harder. They they want to see something that's that's somehow more approachable as a result. And no, it really is. And, and the same thing, I, I get driven nuts because I'll share something I've done. And people are like, well, you can do that because you're a cyborg and you're a robot. It's like, dude, I was a fat 13-year-old kid. Like, I built up to this just over time. You there, Anyone can do that. It's just you know, do what you're doing today, then just do a little bit more than that tomorrow. And yeah, you'll eventually build up where this is just punching the clock. Yeah, yeah. No no one sees the story. They just come in 
like during the highlight reel mm-hmm. and end and they just make these massive assumptions not fully understanding what you did to get there because uh-huh. i spoke about your diet like when you were growing up mm-hmm. yeah can, i mean can you speak about that and how that got you into such a condition that you had to make that change or well it, and so yeah absolutely and so again i i don't fault my parents at all my parents loved me they absolutely loved me and they loved me by being providers and they loved me by teaching me independence and i love that about them but as a result when you take a not grown up adult and you give them all the tools they need to be independent they're gonna not make good decisions you know i knew how to make breakfast that was pop tarts <laughs> i knew how to make lunch that was leftover pizza i knew how to you know and so i i took care of myself just fine and so i <coughs> ate a lot of you know just overly processed junk and and i didn't know any better um yeah. And, and, you know, nutrition was so terrible back then anyways, as far as the information went, you know, we, we all thought that grains were the savior and they were going to make us all, you know, better and fitter and meat was bad for you and eggs were poison. And, and so, you know, I, 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 I ate a very grain heavy, low protein, highly processed food diet, uh, leading up till when I was uh, 14, at which point I was still eating a lot of the same foods. I was just eating less of them, which was a good lesson. You know, it's, because because portions at least the in the United States are just ridiculous and and you know it's learning about how to how to walk away not stuffed from a meal that was a big lesson but yeah you know I was just I was I was eating like an unsupervised child is really what it boiled down to until until finally just one day I I realized it's like you know this this isn't who I want to be I looked at myself and I was like this this is not who I want to present myself as there's something better than me than this and so the summer I was uh, 14, I lost 20 pounds. I was uh, 176 pounds at 5'9 with a 36-inch pant size, which was probably like a 40-inch waist. <laughs> and I dropped down to about 150, got down to like a 32-inch pant size. And yeah, it was I, I from there that was that was the start of it. Yeah. So so let's like dig deep into your nutritional strategy over time mm-hmm. because that's a big part of mm-hmm your like whole thing jared because yeah, yeah. I, I i've always like read your journey through your logs on teenation and mm-hmm. through contributions to reddit however there seems to have been a change at some point recently but mm-hmm. let's go through like your, your nutritional strategy over the years and how it's evolved to where it's at now yeah definitely definitely love to talk about that so when I, I told you about adolescence, getting up to about 14, and then, uh, so it was the late 90s, early 2000s, and Atkins had become real big. Uh, I don't know if Atkins made it to Europe, but in the United States, it was uh, basically a ketogenic diet done by Dr. Atkins. And uh, it was, ketogenic diets had been around for a long time, but he was able to sort of market it and package it and sell it in a way that was a lot more digestible to people, primarily because it was this idea that, hey, eat all the bacon uh, and eggs that you want and lose all the weight. And, you know, that, that sold people on it. So my family became uh, Atkins-esque uh, for a bit there. I was able to kind of get them all on board because I was reading stuff online at that point. I was like, this is the future. This is going to solve all of our problems. Uh, and, and from there, I discovered low carb. And as a result, like, I just I thrive on low carb and it's just something in my genetic line. I think just somewhere in there, carbs weren't so great to me. And and uh, a very low carb meat heavy diet just really just just it suits me well. So I did low carb for a while, but I did like teenage stupid low carb. I was eating deli meat with, you know, I, I, I'd order a sandwich with no bread and just eat the deli meat. Uh, I got to college there and they had a dining hall. So I was eating like three cheeseburgers, no bun. Uh, I was, uh, you know, meatballs with no no bread. Uh, I ate peanut butter by the jar full. And again, just I, I was a broke college kid on a meal plan. And and uh, I met my wife in college. And so I, I frequently tell young men, hey, find a really attractive girl that likes you and wants to buy you food. And that'll cover another portion of your meal plan if you're an athlete looking to get bigger. Uh, because she absolutely took care of me. Uh, my in-laws are actually coming into town today, so the, their their sponsorship of me uh, continues through the years. Uh, but so yeah, I was I was doing that in college for quite a while, and then uh, I read Super Squats by Randall Strawson, and he talks about drinking a gallon of milk a day in there, and that was the senior year of my college, 
And I decided, yeah, game on. Let's give that a go. So um, the very first time I ran super squats was my senior year of college. I drank a gallon of milk a day. And at that point, the low carbs went away because I'm like, I'm trying to get big. So I was eating sandwiches and peanut butter and jelly and pasta. And and that's the part people miss in that program is like the gallon of milk is just a part of it. But you're you're when you're not drinking a gallon of milk, you are eating everything you can just to survive. And so I put on 12 pounds in six weeks doing that one from 190 to 202, the very first time I'd ever been over 200 pounds. And that was uh, kind of the beginning of the end for a while there, because at that point, that was 2007, I graduated. So 2008, I got into reading Dave Tate on Elite FTS. And I don't know if you've ever had the joy of reading Dave's early nutrition logs, but yeah. Oreos by the sleeve full and, and candy. Oh, boy, on the pizza. Yep, yep, all over on the pizza, little Debbie's. And at that point, I had hung up the gloves. I'd stopped doing uh, martial arts because I'd gotten married. I graduated college, got married, and martial arts takes a long time commitment. Lifting weights, you can really do in like an hour a day or less. But martial arts, you two to three hours a day, three, four times a week, just to kind of be kind of good. And if you want to be serious, you're talking five to six days a week. I was a newlywed. I wasn't going to tell my new spouse, hey, I'll you're not going to see me for 18 hours a day. So I can be just kind of okay at martial arts. So <laughs> I stopped doing martial arts, but now I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to become big and strong. So at that point, especially newlywed had a wife loved to cook for me, loved her food. Oh my God. My wife, she grew up in Maui, but her mom grew up in Iowa on a farm. So my yeah. wife has the best menu because it's Hawaiian barbecue mixed with Iowa Midwest farm food. And like, if you want to talk anabolic, it doesn't get better than that. So I, I had the best food, meatloafs and shepherd's pies and mashed potatoes and uh, Hawaiian chicken and, and all that. Plus, I was still drinking a bunch of milk and, and my wife loves to bake and I love to eat baked goods. So at that point, I got up. I was trying to get to 220. And it's because uh, at the time, Matt Kroslowski, now Janae Kroslowski, he was five foot nine, same height as me. He competed as a 220. So I was like, well, if I get to be 220, I'll be jacked like Kroxlowski, which doesn't work that way when yeah. Kroc was cutting down from 272 and I was moving up to 220. I got up to 217 pounds, which is the highest body weight I'd ever been. Uh, I was I was strong as hell for being 21 years old, but I was certainly pretty fat at that point. Right. So you were trying to get like to Crocs level. Mm-hmm which was what from 270 down to 220 you were trying to get at 220 yeah exactly exactly how did he at the time look i mean Cro oh croc at croc is a 220 athlete i mean and i mean he went on to bodybuilding got even leaner but as a power lifter croc was jacked out of his mind at 220 just just ferocious looking uh lean full abdominals giant muscle bellies just just any uh, and of course I had it in me. It's like I wanted to be strong, but I also wanted to be jacked. You know, yeah. I, couldn't be, I couldn't be a bodybuilder, of course. No, no, bodybuilders are, are, are weak. But, you know, a, a strong powerlifter or a strong, strong man who's also jacked. Yeah, that's that's absolutely the thing. Yeah, like just to go off on a tangent, Croc was like, it's, Croc's videos were legendary at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the deadlift videos, the intensity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See them anymore? You never see anything like that. It was really raw, but uh, you've just you've just like gave me a thought there because I've I've not thought about those since I seen them like 10, 12 years ago. Oh yeah, they're iconic. They just stick in your head. Yeah, absolutely. So the point I'm trying to make is is like he he at the time was obviously like chemically assisted. I think that's common knowledge. Mm -hmm. I apologize, but like so you were trying to get to that level naturally. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, that, that ties back into the whole stories, legends, myths, things that I talk about, because I never, that never even mentioned my head about how some people might have chemical assistance and some might. Yeah. It, it's just it's there. I'm like, it's there. Someone can do it. And if someone can do it, why can't it be me? Why can't yeah. I also do it? And if someone hasn't done it, why can't it be me? You know, it's it, I, I, I read the story of Samson. I read the story of Heracles. I'm like, you know what? Game on. Like. It, are they myths? Are they legends? Sure, juggernaut. Yeah, he's six foot ten, nine hundred pounds. Whatever, I'll do it. Like it's, yeah. it's there. I think we all go through that phase. When I first started uh, lifting weights in two thousand, I genuinely believed I was going to look like Chris Benoit and six. Mm -hmm. Like I had this vision in my head, I would have that physique. And mm -hmm. I was, my, my, I was in my early twenties at that time. So it shows you how much it can. 
mess with people's heads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Start to see what's really taking place and what's happening. So when you got up to two twenty, were you like, how were you looking? Were you bulky? Were you just? Do you think a lot of it was fat game? I, I mean, there's certainly a fat game to it, absolutely. But you know, you any anyone that saw me knew I lifted weights, and that was the big thing. Is I was the big guy, uh, yeah. which, which you know that carries with itself so much baggage in and of itself because you, you establish that it's kind of hard to lose that part of your identity. Uh, but yeah, no, I was I was certainly heavy. I, I got to like a 34 pant size. Uh, I was slow as hell. I tried running a mile and a half. It took me 14 and a half minutes. Uh, I, you know, I was, I was not in shape at all. Yeah. Conditioning had gone to the wayside. All I was doing was chasing those big three numbers. Yeah. So like going through your log, it seemed to take a, like, things seemed to take a turn. Or that's the way it looked to me. And it got to the point where it looked like food was consuming the majority of your life. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so a big part of that was uh, about 10 years later, I pretty much copied that exact story. What it boiled down to was I signed up for a strongman competition where it had a 275 pound cake press overhead. And at the time, my best cake press was 200 pounds. So I had about 12 weeks to add 75 pounds to my cake press. I love challenges like that. That's insane. So I just, I went right back to what had worked before and I just started eating everything I could because I was going up a weight class. And as a result, I, I had zero fear of being too heavy. I didn't think I was going to be possible. So I was eating everything I could to get there. It initially started out clean ish, but that quickly went away. Uh, yeah. I, I remember I had three pre workout meals. I'd have the pre pre workout meal and the pre work pre workout meal and the pre workout meal and then I would train and one of them was an entire Quest frozen pizza, uh, one of them was some sort of oatmeal and whey protein and cream and 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 cereal concoction, and one was like a gigantic peanut butter and honey sandwich, and and then I would of course have a post workout meal and so I was doing I was eating all of this and. I got the strongest I'd ever been in my life by doing that. I, I have the video online of me pressing 265 pounds with an axle over my head and just barely missing 275 pounds. Uh, and that was at a body weight of about 210 pounds, just absolutely just inhumanly strong. And I got so big that I had trouble squatting. I couldn't get the bar on my back the way it used to be. It wouldn't fit anymore. Um, it just, just a testament to how much I completely shaped my body. But the big issue was I went and got some blood work done after that was all said and done. And my um, my LDL, which, you know, quickly summarizes the bad cholesterol, had spiked to 200, which like 100 is kind of where they want you to be. Uh, and so when that happened, uh, suddenly I had to do a, a gigantic pivot. And I was like, well, food got me into this. Food will get me out. But I got I got obsessive about how I ate. And and it was just damaging. I just, I, you know, food, food used to be an ally to me and now it became this enemy and I was just fighting against it and everything was so calculated and precise and thought out. And I had to plan every single meal and it was just, it was just becoming way too much. And, you know, my wife, God bless her. She was with me the whole time, but I felt terrible for how much I was just occupying all of our free time with my food the cooking it, the buying it, the prepping it, the cleaning up after it. It was just, it was all I did to live. And just, it was no way to live. Yeah. I remember specifically when you would go on trips uh, mm -hmm. work, and you would post photographs and mm -hmm. it, it's almost like you were taking like a cooker. It was a traveling kitchen. Yeah. Just to kind of make sure that your meal prep was on point. Mm -hmm. And obviously it was working for you because you were in these, uh, unbelievable workouts but there was always that like obviously at the point we're at now there was possibly that potential it was becoming dysfunctional at that point absolutely absolutely yeah no that's that's no way to live it, you know it was just it was a way to survive but it was not a way to live yeah yeah so i mean you contribute to the gain at uh, reddit like you're quite mm -hmm. uh, you're very popular on there you're probably the go-to guy with regards to bulking up mm -hmm. so going with like that knowledge you gained throughout that phase in your life what are the top three tips 
for someone who wants to bulk up? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the, the big thing I keep fighting there is don't go with your nuclear option first. And so the nuclear option is usually like a 1500 calorie shake. And that's, uh, there's times and places for that. It, there absolutely is, but it needs to be your last resort. And the reason I bring that up is because it's about building habits. And just like how training is about just sort of incrementally nudging yourself up, it's the same way with nutrition. And it's how I've always approached it. If I needed to gain, I'd have a baseline. Let's say I, I let's say for breakfast, I eat three eggs and a four ounce cut of meat. And that's breakfast. Well, if I want to gain, I'll up the meat to five ounces. And I'll just keep eating that until that doesn't work. And then I'll add an egg white to the meal. And, you know, I'll just keep eating that until that doesn't work. And over time, eventually you look down at your plate. It's like I'm eating 27 eggs and, you know, 14 <laughs> bone steaks. Like this is – but you built up to it and your body doesn't think anything of it. But if, like, you go from three eggs and a four-ounce steak to, like, I'm going to eat that and then drink this 1,500-calorie shake, yeah, you'll gain three pounds in three weeks. And then your body will be like, cool, what's next? And you're like, I, shit, I, I don't know. I, uh, I ran out of stomach room. Uh, but if you wait until you're at that point where you're eating like the dozen eggs and the four steaks and you're not gaining weight, it's like, I better bring in this shake like that. That gives your body that change. And the the big thing is, is that guys are they want they say they want to gain weight, but then they're afraid of gaining weight. And they're like, I want to gain weight, but I want to gain it as slow as possible and only have it be 100 percent muscle. And so, you know, they're they're too afraid to make these sort of transitions. And, you know, here, here I'm going to talk duality here because first I just said, hey, don't bring in your nuclear option right away. But the thing is, you do have to do something to promote change, because yeah. if you just add like one Girl Scout cookie to your weekly intake, your body will adapt to that. It'd be like, cool, I guess I eat Girl Scout cookies now. But if you do in a week's span, bring a big hammer of meat into the diet. Then it'll be like, whoa, whoa, this is new. Let me let me adapt to this input, and that's going to mean I need to put on a little bit more muscle. So there's kind of two tips there, and one is like, don't don't right away bring in the absolute hammer, but at the same time, you do need to put something into the system to promote change. And if you just if you're too afraid of the incoming change, then then it's not going to have the impact. And you know, I can tie that into the third tip, and that's that. Muscle is so much harder to gain than fat is to lose. And if you just keep that in the back of your mind, you have nothing to fear. Yeah. I always say that the training is what drives nutrition. And that's going to be the big point is that when you're trying to gain weight, what that means is you're going to be training really, really hard. And then you're going to eat to recover from it. And if yeah. you're training hard enough, there's no bad calories. Yeah. You just, you want to recover. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the thinking out there is that people fear cutting more than bulking. Bulking seems like a holiday. Like, yes, I'm going to bulk. It's going to be so much fun. I'm going to eat more food. But more food equals more stress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it also creates the environment to become much way more hungry than you've ever been. Mm -hmm. Much more hungry. I mean, I, as, using this as an anecdote, I, I went on a cut there for like 12 weeks and it was very easy. I was yeah. actually shocked by how easy it was. I kept mm -hmm. a control, but I had that mindset change where, like, whenever I was hungry, I realized that the process was working. Mm -hmm. And when I started bulking, the first couple of weeks were fun because I could eat some, like, naughtier foods at night to try mm -hmm. and calorie count up but I noticed the symptoms of hunger were starting to increase exponentially and my uh, outgoings started to rise exponentially, particularly with the current climate today of food inflation and the stress of going for periods without eating started to filter into the situation. And to be honest with you, I am now at the point where I'm not really enjoying the experience whatsoever. Oh my God, no. I very difficult and like you said you need to factor in how hard you need to work to make those calories count in that respect yeah absolutely no it's uh, the, the big thing i bring up is think about how many success stories you've seen about someone losing 300 pounds yeah then think about how many success stories you see about someone gaining 
100 pounds. Yeah. Gaining muscle is so much harder. There's there you can't trip over people that have lost 300 pounds. You walk through a grocery store and there's a million articles about someone who has done just that. But trying to find people that have put on serious muscular body weight, and there's so few. That alone shows you just that anyone can lose fat, anyone can lose weight, but not that many people can get jacked. That, yeah. that That's the easiest metric for how hard one activity is versus the other. If the average person can do it, it's not that hard. Yeah. You know, I think how many people have a high school diploma and how many people have a PhD like that's that just, you know, simple terms. Yeah, I think it's it's perfectly distilled because I work in a gym and the amount of people that come into the gym and tell me they do not want to put on large amounts of muscle. Yeah. And I'm always looking at them like, Jesus Christ, man, like yeah. you don't know half of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't want to accidentally make three million dollars. OK, well, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll do our best to not let that happen. <laughs> right so let's let's move on to the diet nowadays because i know you've had a you've had a like a really profound experience mm -hmm. as of late with your nutritional strategy yeah. that, i've seen that in your writings i kind of a lot of it resonated with me because although i don't comment i still read your stuff it, it's just, i'm always keeping on top of what you're doing and I appreciate it i could tell there was a really profound experience that had taken place recently it's almost like an epiphany you had yep yep that that sums it up really well and so uh, the big thing i'm i'm big into duality i'm big into extremes uh, moderation's never been my thing and so i went from super squats i went from eating everything that was not nailed down and putting in as many calories as possible to just being done i was done eating i was done actually putting food in my mouth and the easiest solution for that was the, the velocity diet put out by uh, a T Nation and Biotest, uh, which Jamie Lewis also co-opted as the Apex Predator diet. Both of them are uh, premised around the same idea, and that's that the majority of your nutrition comes from protein shakes. And so I have to do a, a double pause there because, for one, the Gainet community, they're so big into shakes, and I'm so anti-shake on there that people have said, you know, I've, I've turned coat there. But... You and I both grew up in an era where protein shake meant something, and that was a scoop of protein or two in water, maybe milk. It did not mean this protein and peanut butter and rice and cereal and oatmeal and pea protein and gelatin and ice cream and heavy cream. Yeah, like that's I tell people it's like if you have 50 grams of protein and 200 grams of carbs, it's a carbohydrate shake. Like how how do you not understand that? Yeah. So, so yeah, this diet is. I actually, just sorry to interject, but no, no, go ahead. The the reason that it was only protein shake and milk was because it was so hard to mix. Yeah. Oh yeah. But in form nowadays, it just digests really easily. It's like fine dust, but oh. years ago, it was clumpy. Oh my god, it was just like paste. Yeah, I didn't even have a blender. I would be there with a fork. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Twenty minutes, and it was just egg protein. So. Uh -huh. it was different. Oh. Yep. Yep. Well, I, I talk about how, like, you know, I, I had sworn off vanilla protein powder for 15 years because I tried some when I first got started and it tasted like wallpaper paste. Like it was horrifying that and like a combination of, of that and gasoline. And so I would drink anything other than that. But finally, uh, Biotest sent me uh, their vanilla stuff. It actually tastes good. And it's actually my preferred flavor of the two that they have. So I'm just living off vanilla shakes these days. Never thought I'd see the way. Um, pun completely unintended, uh, but but yeah. So uh, velocity diet, apex predator. Your the majority of your nutri nutrition comes from protein shakes. Uh, you you have um, three to five shakes a day, depending on who you are, and then you have one to two solid meals, depending on which specific diet you're following or protocol you're following. And with Jamie Lewis's approach, that diet is a pure uh, that that meal is a pure meat meal. And usually it's kind of a higher fat meat meal uh, with velocity. It's a, a healthy solid meal, they call it. It's a variety of stuff, vegetables, uh, um, a little bit of fruit, maybe meat. But you're, you're still kind of keeping it on the lean side. Uh, and, you know, the thing was, after all this time I've spent living as insane as I live, training as hard as I train, like an, an all-shake diet, that was nothing. I mean, the, the biggest thing I had to do, which I wrote about in my, my Family Man series, was I needed to make it so that 
I was eating in a way that was good nutritional modeling for my kid and allowed me to be social with my family because the original yeah. velocity diet had one meal a week. Yeah. And that, I just wasn't going to do that. I was like, no, I need to, I need to have dinner with my family. And yeah. ideally I want to have breakfast with my kid too. And well, bear in mind as well, Jared, the, the velocity, I mean, I'm not too up to scratch with a velocity diet, but the velocity diet didn't have a guy like you in mind when no. it did, like you train like, like Jared Miller. <laughs> so they weren't thinking, right. So I think that you can definitely get some leeway and a diet like the velocity diet, for example. That's a, that's a fair point as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it was originally marketed and that's the thing it was marketed as a fat loss diet. And that's yeah. what's so funny is like, I didn't care about that. Uh, yeah. It's, I, I was, I was after super squats, I still had visible, visible abdominals. Like I still, I was heavy for me. Yeah. I was, I'd broken 200 pounds again, but I was, I was lean ish, but yeah, yeah you no, know, originally it was this uh 28 day, just fat loss crash course. But, uh, <laughs> So when, like, so what, what was the moment when you realized that something was wrong, like that you had to make that change? Uh, so the, the big one I keep referencing was I came home late from work one day and I literally ate until I went to sleep because I was an hour off my schedule that I had no time for, for my family. And so I hung out with my kid, sure. But while I was hanging out with my kid, I was eating a snack on the couch. And the whole time my wife was telling me about her day, I was in the middle of cooking one meal while eating another meal. And then I was making my lunch for the next day. And then I was washing the dishes of the food I made while my meal was cooking so that I could eat that before I went to bed. Yeah. And and like I was like, this is ridiculous. You know, just to, to have to eat like this to sustain the level of training. And I was so physically broken at that point. From I was the strongest I'd ever been. <laughs> and at the same time, just like my knee was shot, my hip was shot. Uh, I, I tried to do burpees and like, I would basically just fall to the floor and just pick myself back up uh -huh. again. And it was just, yeah, I was, I was, I was in a, in an interesting place where I was uh, as strong and broken as I could have been. And I was eating, uh, I was eating like a champion and also just not at all thriving. And I had filled up so much of the volume of my food with what I was calling fake food. Yeah, and, you know, just just keto treats and and little tricks and 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 starvation foods is the other thing I would call it. Just nut butters and and all the things that you eat when you don't have real food that's around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just I just I just needed to simplify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how how did going from that to a shake predominant a shake dominant diet affect your training, or did it have any effect in your training? So, I, you know, once again, training drives nutrition. So I made sure to follow a protocol that I could follow this on. If I had seen on super squats, this wouldn't have worked. I, I would have just blown up on the runway. So instead, I, I cracked into 531 Forever, which is just an old reliable staple, uh, rediscovered the Cryptea program that Jim Wendler put out there, which is supposed to basically prep you to get in shape, then get you in shape, then keep you in shape. And so I ran the prep phase of it. And while doing that, then Jamie Lewis released his newest uh, ebook, which was the Feast, Famine, and Ferocity Diet, which uh, the, the famine portion of that is so close to what I was doing. It, it was just square peg, square hole. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, you don't game on. Let's go ahead and give this a try. Yeah. And yeah, it, it fit perfectly. And as a result, I'm actually seeing progress in my training. Like I'm, I'm, quite a bit stronger than I've ever been, especially at this level of leanness, especially at this body weight. I'm seeing growth from session to session. Uh, my conditioning, I, I hit a lifetime PR on burpee chins yesterday. I got 50 of them done in four minutes and 10 seconds flat. And that was in the middle of mowing my lawn. Uh, that was after I'd had my gigantic cheat meal at Pizza Ranch where I was just walking around bloated like a tick. Uh, it was just a thing I did cold while wearing my lawn mowing shoes. I'm like, let me let me get my heart rate up before this happens again. Um, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely thriving and, you know, the shakes are part of it. And the other part of it too, is I, I transitioned the, the meals that I do have, they're just pure meat or animal based meals. And that was kind of the thing is that with, with velocity diet, with apex predator, 
you eat so little food that when you do finally have a chance to eat any sort of food, you really prioritize. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I could have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I guess, sure, but like that's just gonna bring a bunch of garbage that I don't need. Or instead, it's like, what do I need? Well, I need, I need protein. I need some fats. Let's let's go get that. And we know what oh, meat's got that. Yeah, so I, I, I'm sorry about the dog. No, you're fine. You're fine. Appearance felt at some point. Yeah. So would you say it almost recent, like desensitized or resensitized your taste buds to a certain degree? You know, the taste buds uh, hit or miss. You know, food food's always been delicious to me, but it's definitely it's definitely um for one thing, it let me know what I could do without because I had convinced myself that I needed these gigantic, just monumental meals before and after I went to sleep in order to, to continue training the way I did. And when put into a corner and told, no, this is what you get to eat, you know, deal with it. And I dealt with it. I'm like, oh, I can still I can still perform with very little food in me. I can still grow with very little food in me as long as whatever it is in me is high quality. And so if I'm just getting nothing but protein in me and that's what my body knows is in it, it's it's going to perform just fine because it knows that this is what it's got to work with. Yeah. Well, one thing that always stands out to me regarding yourself, Jared, is how you always stick religiously to tried and tested programs. You never program for yourself with mm -hmm. regards to like – bodybuilding style training, strength training and the likes, you always go with a tried and tested program. Is that to minimise the, 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 the process, which can be quite stress inducing of programming for yourself so that you can devote your energies into the, the, the non-training like habits and variables? Well, the, the big thing is, is that, you know, there's, there's phases of training. Everything I do is phasic. And so if I'm outside of a competition phase, then my goal is to improve and to progress. And the thing is, is I will not instinctively do the things that it takes to improve our progress. And that's just sort of, we all have our own little self-preservation thing. And what that boils down to is that we naturally will do the things that we're good at and we'll avoid the things that we're bad at because we want that affirmation of just doing the things that we like to do. When I want to do my best in a competition, I do program for myself because I'm very good at knowing what I'm good at. And I'll just keep doing those things and get really good at them. But when I need to grow, when I need to change, when I need to progress, I need someone else to tell me what to do because they're going to make me do things that I won't naturally do on my own. They'll make me do front squats, which I'll avoid. They'll make me do a lot of different rows, which I'll avoid. They'll make me do just the things that I don't typically will do. And as a result, when my body is put in a situation where it's doing something it doesn't naturally gravitate towards, it has to change in progress and adapt to those demands that are put upon it. But when I tell it, hey, we're just going to do the things that we like to do, it thrives, but it doesn't change. It just it gets really good at the things it's good at. Yeah. OK, so going by your lengthy knowledge on tried and tested programs, give me the top three programs that someone should use if they are looking to lay on some serious lean tissue. Absolutely. So I don't know what the first one's going to be, but I'll let you tell me. It's definitely going to be super squats. Absolutely. <laughs> and of course I say, when I say super squats, please don't just do the program. Please don't just do the program. There is a book it is a short book. It can be read in an afternoon, read it multiple times because it will answer all the questions you have and it'll tell you how to run the program because every single person I know that tries to run the program based off YouTube clips and things they found online, they crash and they burn and they screw it up so bad. And it's really not a complex program, but it does have some nuance and it needs to be understood in order to be effective. Okay. Uh, so we've started at number one, so we're obviously moving up the ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. beyond that, uh, it was going to be John Anderson's Deep Water Program. Uh, I cannot sing its phrases enough because it will put you in a situation you've never been in before and it will force you to grow. It will traumatize you. Uh, I, I, I love telling this story, but there's 10 sets of 10 in the very beginning of the program. And when you move on to intermediate, you get those 100 reps done in, in fewer sets. But during those 10 sets of 10, you go through a transformation. And in between set six and seven on one of the squat workouts i was laying on my back because that's what i started having to do because i was so exhausted and in the four minute span between those two sets 
I literally contemplated selling my entire home gym and quitting lifting. I had hated the program so much and was so ready to just stop everything that that it, it broke me. And then within those four minutes, I rebuilt myself and picked myself up off the ground and did the next set. But it just shows you the kind of headspace that that program puts you in. It's absolutely transformative. And the nutrition in it, I, I, I think, cannot be overstated. It's, it's similar to what I'm doing now. It's not as shake heavy, but it's low carbohydrate, high focus on quality food, lots of meat. I don't think you can go wrong with that. Uh, and then I'm just going to do the plug for what I'm doing right now. And that's the Jamie Lewis Feast, Famine, and Ferocity program. And I realize I've only run it one time, but it has, it's been life-changing for me. It absolutely has. Uh, I've bugged Jamie enough to the point that I think he's ignoring my texts and, and uh, Facebook messages now. But his his book, it also contains nutritional information. In it. it has a full program in it. It has a full protocol. And it really just opened me up and and liberated me to make these sort of decisions that are necessary and the thing is is that jamie fully encourages experimentation in the book so if you are the kind of guy that can't stick with a with a full-up program then it it still suits you but it gives you the tools necessary to be able to sort of make these sort of radical transformations i love the book because feast is one phase of the program famine's another so it actually has built-in periodization which i'm big on it's phasic training and phasic dieting and so if you need just an all in one sort of approach to training in a very short ebook, it'd be a, a fantastic read to get started. Yeah. Yeah. So when you made that point about deep water, mm -hmm. contemplating selling your home gym, was that a spark that lit the flame for having this conditioning heavy mindset? No, no. Uh, it was really back. What what drove that was the LDL high diagnosis. Right, okay. uh, when, and, and so that actually happened uh, well after my initial run of deep water. Uh, deep, deep water, you know, it, I, I definitely started including conditioning, but it wasn't until I had to turn the ship around health wise that like conditioning became the big driver in my training. Prior to that, conditioning was cool. I thought conditioning was dandy, especially as a strong man. It was helpful. I did a lot of conditioning medleys. I wanted to be in shape. But when suddenly my actual health and future was compromised, then I, I said, maximal strength, uh, it's gone now. I don't care. I just want to get in shape and I want to be in the best shape of my life. And in doing that, you spending a few years focusing on that, then getting to rebuild from there. I was in a great state to rebuild. Yeah, yeah. So what would you also give, if you were to give three pieces of advice to people, like having learned what you have from using these programs and training throughout the years, to gain muscle, what would it be? So the big one, of course, is training drives nutrition. You, you're not going to force an anabolism and muscular gain by just force feeding. And that's where people screw up is they'll they'll just do the bare minimum in training and then they'll sit down at the Chinese buffet and just gorge themselves and then be like, all I did was get fat. It's like, well, yeah, you weren't training hard. I mean, you know, of course, that's that's what happens when you eat a lot and don't really work very hard. But instead, like deep water is a great example because you finish a deep water workout and it's like a timer is going off and you have to just eat until the next workout. And you hope and you pray that you ate enough between those workouts that you recover. And I would legit run out of time on my lunch hour. I would just get the fork and just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And, eat. and then I ran out of time. I'm like, God, I hope that was enough food because I have to do another deep water workout tomorrow. And by the skin of my teeth, I'd manage sometimes. And other times I, I'm like, you know what? I, I better, I better eat before this workout. I better do something. I got to come up with some sort of solution. So that's the big thing is you, you need to train hard enough to create a stimulus in your body so that it will want to put on, so that it will have to put on muscle. It has no choice but to put on muscle. And then at that point, when the engine's hot enough, it'll burn anything. You you will put fuel in it and it will turn into muscle. Uh, other tip too is real food. Eat real food. And you know what a bizarre concept that is to have to say that, but it's true. People don't people don't want to cook. People don't want to put in the bare minimum effort of cooking. And with air fryers and instant pots and just all the kitchen gadgetry out there, there's no excuse now. Yeah. You know, with a Foreman grill and an instant pot, you can make just about anything and, and it'll be easy. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I have zero sympathy for people that talk about getting bored with food. You know, it's like what a, what a what a pleasant li- luxury to have that you can have the freedom to be bored of food. Yeah, absolutely. And I I am so, you know, I have zero sympathy for your plight. The rest of us will just eat a dozen eggs and call it good. Uh, and so, you know, just if if you focus on just eating just real human food for the majority of your nutrition and then have treats and, and gap fillers where needed, you'll be fine. But if you fill everything with those gap fillers first and have no room for real food, you're not going to grow. And that pisses people off so much because it's unscientific. But you know what? Prove it to me. Go ahead and eat a diet of nothing but Pop-Tarts and whey protein. I'll eat a diet of steak and eggs. We'll see who looks better at the end of it. It's, it, it's just it's a no brainer. You know, people just don't. People don't want to believe it. And, you know, that'd probably be the final point is it's simple. And when you if you're making it complex, you're you've probably screwed something up. It really is not that hard. It's people have been getting big, strong and jacked for millennia. And all they did was they worked hard and they ate big. And if you're not doing those things, then you're not going to succeed. Yeah. Okay. So what are your top five exercises for getting jacked? Oh, boy. Okay, that is a tough one. Um. So the big thing is generating hunger, uh, and so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with just the prowler, um, which I realize doesn't you know sound like anything, and it doesn't have to yeah. be the prowler specifically, but just some sort of like conditioning that hits the whole body. So uh, kettlebell work would be fine too, uh, weighted vest walks, sleds, prowler, but just something that is gonna just make you hungry. And again, that pisses off a lot of people because a lot of people, they want to get jacked and they think that that means they have to minimize conditioning and cardio because they can't waste the calories. But it's such the opposite. And and a very good profound quote I've heard is that you can undo 60 minutes of cardio with 30 seconds of eating. (laughs) And if you keep that in mind, like there's no reason to fear you go go run for 60 minutes and then eat four donuts. And suddenly you you more than undid the effect of that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll put that over there. Um, putting weight over your head from the floor. You got to find some way to pick it up from the floor, put it over your head. I don't care how you do it, but if you do that enough, you will get jacked. And if all you ever did was that, you would be jacked. If you did that and the prowler, you'd be a monster. I have told people a dozen times, I think the log viper press and the prowler push, those two things, if you gave me an athlete, they can only do those two things. I give them those two things. They would stomp anyone in their path with just those two movements you're if you're going to allow me more movements beyond that uh i would include some manner of squat um i i think the front squat is probably more ideal and and i i say that as a guy who's literally never done one from a rack position i have to do the arms folded kind of the safety squat bar squat but whenever i throw front squats into a program i get jacked now the thing is one rep maxes don't do it for me I think it's the effect of having to stabilize the weight on your body and forcing it to stay braced and tight. It's one of those that creates that demand stimulus response in your body where it's like, I don't like this. And the only way I'm going to fix this is if I get jacked all over so that I can hold this weight onto my body. A one rep max is over in, you know, eight seconds. The body's like, phew, that's over. I'm done. But if you subject it to like a four minute front squat set, it's going to say, fuck, that sucked. I don't ever want to do that again. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I've got to go with two more. Um, and that's the thing. As I usually run out uh, at that point, I'm like, no, no, we're good. Uh, so now it's more like a, um, auxiliary stuff there. Well, uh, just what were you thinking? I just want to like add this in. It was the Tabata front squats that you did for mm-hmm. a sustained period of time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You got into a little uh, routine of trying them, and they were some of the most brutal Mm-hmm. Uh, that I have ever had them. They, they they were pain beyond pain. Oh my goodness! Particularly when you would, I, I started off with two twelves, which is about twenty four pounds in America, mm-hmm. uh, and then moved up to sixteen, and I was on my back every single oh, set. It never never feels good. Yeah, yeah, it, it didn't feel good at all. It felt absolutely awful. It was horrific, actually. In fact, I was actually starting to get pounding headaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm which turned out to be through eating too much canned sardines. From huh. Yeah, I found that out through Googling and stopped eating them, then the, the headaches uh, disappeared. But that was the most brutal conditioning session in that short, short condensed space of time. Not the most brutal conditioning session ever that I've did personally, but 
distilled, yeah. condensed. Yep, yep. And that, you know, I'm a big fan of that. You know, whenever I can get like when I can get the dosage as small as possible and package within that as much intensity as possible, I, I think that's just money. Uh, you know, I, I hate having 30 minutes to work out because like that just stretches on forever. But like you tell me, hey, you have four minutes like, oh, man, came on. This is going to be amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're um, we, we've got moving. We've got putting stuff over your head. We've got front squatting. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably throw in, you know, you got to get in some sort of, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, th this is a great one. Um, loading. And so um, take a log, a keg, a sandbag, a stone, pick it up and just put it onto a platform or, or put it onto your shoulder. Um, I, I think that is phenomenal. And what's great about that, too, is it's got no concentric or no eccentric. Sorry, it's got no eccentric load to it. You pick it up, you put it on the platform, it falls. Same with the prowler, same with putting weight overhead. And what's great when you don't have an eccentric, people talk about how the eccentric is the muscle builder, which is true. But if you want to train something a whole bunch of times and you don't have that eccentric load, you just keep hammering the hell out of it. So it's great for active recovery. It's great for being able to come back to training multiple times. It's great for building up just incredible volume. Uh, and, and if you want to, you can always bring that eccentric load to it. You can control the eccentric on an overhead press. Uh, the front squat gives you some sort of eccentric um, uh, opportunities there. But I, lo I love movements where there's an option not to have that eccentric load. And I think that's where, where loading really comes in there as well. And then um, if I had to pick, um, you know, you, you need some sort of uh, heavy abdominal. So I would kind of throw in uh, uh, probably the ab wheel, um, sort of the, the the Dan John push, pull, hinge, squat, load to carry uh, ab wheel idea there. Because uh, it's it's amazing how many guys don't want to train their midsection. And that's just where the, the center of power is going to come from. And you have a strong core and you can radiate in all sorts of different directions. I failed a 500 pound squat in a powerlifting meet two times. And then finally, I started focusing on bringing in the uh, the core work and went up just like that. It, it's just the damnedest thing. Yeah, I think training's a lot for most people. And like to go back to something you said earlier where guys are too paranoid to like put on any weight in case they lose their abs when the answer is actually it's just starting to hammer the ab work at that point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's in body fat levels you're going to put muscle on in that region and it's going to mitigate that loss of the abdominal region so to speak or the six pack it definitely will yep yeah but i just tend to find that this, this the standing ab wheel is just it's very difficult to progress to, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's one you need to work up to. So, yep. any, like, we've kind of ran on for a bit, and I've got family duties that need attention yep. to. So just before we go, I've got a couple of things to say. And the first one is a question I would like to end this on. If you could go back in time, Jared, and speak mm -hmm. to that 14, 15-year-old who was binging on Pop-Tarts... <laughs> and was starting his training journey, what, what was a, a simple piece of advice you would give them? Learn to cook three meals. <laughs> uh, you know, no joke. And that's one of those things I'm imparting to my kid. I want them just to know just, just three simple meals and just rotate between them. Um, and so that would cover the nutrition part of it. And, if, and, you know, to cover the training part of it, it would just be the whole uh, effort, consistency, and, and time. And just let them know, hey, you know, trust yourself is the big thing. Like, I, I keep going back to 14. And I knew so much more then than I did now. And the big thing I, I knew then was that I could train as hard as I wanted to. Yeah. And I, I had to learn, you know, quote, unquote, I learned the opposite of that in my 20s. And then I rediscovered it in my 30s. Like, no, I really can train as hard as I want to. I don't I don't have to ever live in myself. I just got to make sure that I'm eating to support it. And it'll it'll work itself out. Oh, superb. So before we go, I would just like to say something as well. And it's to anyone who's listening to the podcast or is watching this on YouTube, that the reason that I'm actually hosting this podcast is indirectly through Jared. And for most people that don't know, a lot of people think that when I started doing burpees, it was because of the Iron Wolf. But the actual story is that it was Jared who was doing burpees. I always thought that burpees were a stupid exercise, where like performed by people in fitness classes as a punishment but 
Jared was using them as part of his conditioning protocol. And when you see Jared and you, you realise the guy's in, a, in phenomenal shape. And when Jared was doing uh, burpees, it kind of gave me the green light to do them as well. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I think that's how fitness works. When you, you Some people validate exercises that you might not have. 100% belief in and when I knew they were good enough for Jared I thought well I'm going to give them a shot and that's when I went down the rabbit hole and discovered guys like the Iron Wolf and the Buppy community so I would like to just pay that level of respect to Jared and let people know that the reason I am where I am today with regards to my channel and so forth is because of Jared he was a big influence in me uh, when I discovered his works so thanks very much for that Jared so before we go, is there any way that people can access your works or find yeah. on other platforms? Absolutely. So I have a blog that I've been writing in for over a decade now, uh, Mythical Strength. You just Google the word Mythical Strength, you'll find me. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Emma Voss, uh, E M E V A S. <laughs> Easy way to remember that is that's the uh, phrase save me spelled backwards. Came up with it when I was 14, it just kind of stuck. Uh, I'm on Reddit as Mythical Strength. Uh, I'm on T Nation as uh, The Punisher, which is spelled uh, T three H P W N I S H E R. Once again, that's what happens when you come up with things when Elite Speak is popular. But uh, I'll own the handle, and uh, yeah, any anywhere through there they can find me. Yeah, I'm sorry about the dog barking there, you? No worries, no worries. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> This guy is he's, he's he's podcast fuel. He's, he's he's been a nightmare for the last couple of podcasts. Yeah, but, yeah. That's how they are. But anyway, hopefully we can drown that noise out in the edit or whatever. So listen, Jared, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. It's it's been a joy. Uh, I always enjoy speaking to you, and I'm pretty sure that the people that are going to listen to this will get a lot from it. So once again, thanks very much, mate. No, thank you so much for having me, Lee. I appreciate it. Anytime, bro. I'll take it easy. Hey, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.